Good evening. Welcome to today's webinar from Libro Credit Union on budget building blocks, the dreaded B word for some people. And that's not really fair. We, we do know here at Libro that many of our owners actually love budgets and we do have some that like to present very detailed budgeting ideas, but we also have others where it's not so much, shall we say. And we're hopeful that tonight's webinar will, will provide some great tips and tricks towards helping towards that budget building process. Um, on behalf of, of all of my colleagues here at Libro, uh, my name is Paul McQueen. I am the VP of Wealth at Libro. I'd actually prefer my title to be something a little different because I don't ex think that explains what our coaches do every day, um, but the preferred title for me would probably be uh, Investor Behavior and Financial Planning, which is more accurately describing the work that our coaches do with our owners every day. You jump ahead, Sky, please. So I'll be joined by Doug Carroll, a tax and estate specialist from Aviso Wealth, and I will introduce Doug shortly. Libra Credit Union, proud to sponsor tonight's event. We do have 36 locations across Southwestern Ontario, serving over 110,000 owners today. On behalf of my 700 plus colleagues, welcome to tonight's call. We do find that some of these webinars fit very well with our B Corp purpose, uh, our being a purpose-based business model. For those of you not familiar with what a B Corp is or a certified B Corporation, it, it, we're, we're dedicated to not just running a business, but running a business that meets high standards of both societal and environmental impact. We've decided to focus in on four particular areas, what we refer to as pillars internally, uh, in some of these areas around employment, financial resilience, local food accessibility, and housing. Obviously, tonight's topic ties in clearly with financial resilience. There will certainly be uh, time for questions during today's presentation. Unfortunately, just given the nature of the program, it does have to be a little one directional. You can see and hear us, but we cannot see and hear you. So if you do want to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature. There's a little image there uh, on the screen of what that looks like. For these kinds of public forums, general questions work best. If you have a question that's really specific or you know, in some cases might even be a little bit personal, uh, please feel free to ask it. We'll do our best to answer them in general terms, but there may be times where it's appropriate to refer your question to one of our coaches at Libro. If you want to reach out to our coaches directly instead of asking a question in the chat, that's certainly an option as well. If you know who your coach is and you know how to contact them, fantastic. And if you don't, Libro.ca slash contact can help you get that set up. A recording of tonight's webinar will be available after the event on Libro.ca on our events page. That link will be included in a follow up email as well as some handouts from our guest speaker this evening. Speaking of our guest speaker this evening, proud to be joined by Doug Carroll. Doug is the tax and estate specialist for Aviso Wealth, a wealth management partner to credit unions across Canada. The credit unions generally aren't big enough on our own to have our own securities dealers, and so we've collectively worked together uh, along with some other partner organizations. Um, those of you who get investment statements from us may be familiar with credential asset management or credential securities. Those are subsidiaries of Aviso, the dealer that Doug is here representing this evening. Doug previously ran an estate planning law practice and was an advanced case consultant with a life insurer and a mutual fund provider. Doug holds a business degree and a master's of law specializing in tax and is qualified as a certified financial planner professional and a trust and estate practitioner. He's been doing this for over 25 years, supporting our financial advisors for everything from written articles to individual case consultations where that makes sense. And of course, webinars like the one we're presenting today. Very proud to be joined by Doug and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Paul. And I'm going to shoot up my screen here so that we've got that for our background and uh and off we go uh, uh just wave at me that the background is up here i've got my uh, my slide going and uh i'll continue on with that good all right thank you very everybody for uh, for joining us here for this session as paul gave you the rundown of my background i i am a lawyer i don't practice law anymore 
directly in private practice, but I work in this type of a role where I'm supporting advisors and, and their clients in a different way. I would say though, despite that I've got the, what, what would appear to be the more uh, deeper topics of, of tax and legal that I can deal with and do deal with in those discussions I have with advisors and with their clients, I would say that this is, uh, is is the one topic that I really do have the the first passion for, budgeting. And it, and as, as as much as it may seem, as Paul said, it's the B word. It, if you can get this down uh, down right in the way that you like to manage your money, then it, it gives you all of that foundation that makes it much easier for you to do the other financial parts of your life. So. <clears throat> I'm going to go through a, a, about eight topics here, and uh, we'll have a few points that I'll, I'll touch on, on on each of these topics. As Paul mentioned, we've got to hand out an article that runs the same uh, some, through the same topics, not exactly the same order necessarily, but it covers off the same things in written version. So uh, not necessary for you to take deep notes on, on this uh, if you're so inclined to do. What we're going to do here is, is take it through that um, uh, that uh, journey, if you will, of of knowing where you are right now, figuring out how it is that you manage money yourself, and coming up with a way that that you want to to budget your money. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, uh, so it, it's not a matter of saying that there is only one way to do budgeting. It's uh, it, it's finding what is uh, what is appropriate for you, what fits with your sensibilities, something that you will sustain, keep on doing, and that does have some logic to it that it actually does help you manage your uh, your finances. So we'll start off with uh, this, this basic idea that uh, quite often comes up, this coffee concept, that sometimes just to, to uh, give it one word or one little concept of, oh, here's what you can do to uh, to budget. If you just cut out a coffee a day, then multiply, depending on where it is you buy your coffees, multiply that out by the number of days in the year and the number of years in your life, and you'll save X amount of dollars, which would be a great idea if you hated coffee, but obviously you don't because you do have that coffee. So the idea of, of just uh, depleting yourself and and taking sacrifices out of your your life is not going to work for uh, for most people. What we're trying to do is optimize how it is that we live within our means. I often say when when I'm talking about estate planning, uh, when uh, when people are are looking at at uh, what they're doing with their lives, the the ideal to do is live within your means now, save towards the future, and live within your means later on. So you want to be able to optimize what sources of money that you have, understanding what they are, and making sure that you are staying within the boundaries of what it is that you have. Not necessarily that you are putting things down to the penny on a spreadsheet, whether it's in pencil and paper or in, uh, in a digital format, and, and trying to stay exactly under that particular number. And then once you've got to that point, well, you can't do that anymore, whatever that, that thing might be. You do want to make sure that you are paying yourself first. And I'll come back to that later, talking about using charge or credit, but paying yourself first in that you're making sure that you're setting yourself up again on into the future, saving towards the, your future self, giving your future self the opportunity to have the life that you are creating for yourself now because of the habits that you are creating. And in setting up your budget, you want to be comfortable with what you are doing because if you're not comfortable, you're not going to sustain it. It's like it's like dieting. People will say that um, that they, they want to diet and dieting and budgeting is, uh, they're, they're similar in that whether they are they are nouns, a, a diet and a budget, but we talk about them quite often in terms of being verbs, as in dieting and budgeting. And uh, and with both of those, it, it brings up the notion of, of having sacrifice. But really, you do have a diet, you do have a budget in either of those, uh, those arenas, and it's a matter of how you manage the, uh, the, the food intake and your activity in terms of the dieting, and in terms of your budgeting, the sources of income that you have and the spending that you make out of those sources of income. 
And if you're going to, to have a, a successful run at budgeting, it's best if you don't shock yourself by going cold turkey. It'll be more effective in most cases to take baby steps. Better to have some small steps that you take that you sustain, that you continue on, than that you make giant leaps that you cannot continue on. <clears throat> And then the final thing that I'll, I'll touch on here is uh, is maybe uh, a, a reverse phrase or it's a it's kind of a, a running phrase routines breeding habits. You could say that uh, that you want to have good uh, good financial habits and in order to have those good financial habits if you can create routines if you can put timelines on the things that you are doing then it makes it easier to have those uh, those habits continue on. So uh, routines allow you to have habits that you can continue on and in order to be able to have those uh, those habits uh, take you to where you want to go then you can put those habits into routines so that the two are, are very very closely connected the routines being the the timing aspect of things and the and the recurrence of activities that you have in your uh, in your money management in your life in other ways but in this case with uh, with budgeting in your money management so what we want to do as, as a starting point with our uh, our budgeting is uh, is to come up with a way that that you are comfortable with managing your money to be as stringent or as loose as as is appropriate for you and of course being really really loose means that you're really not doing it so you have to put some kind of focus on what it is that you're doing the starting point being where are you right now? So even if you don't go any further forward, taking any active steps, which I really do encourage that you do with, with your money management, just looking over things can give you the, the mindset of, of being conscious of where you're spending your money. And that'll help to, uh, to make sure that you're not overspending in, in all ways, that you're not overspending, but also not overspending in a particular uh, uh, category of spending that, might, that you might have. Now, the subtitle here says, uh, being unperfect but underway. And of course, there's no such word as unperfect, it's imperfect, but who cares? When you see that word unperfect, it's like, okay, well, you know what it means. It means that, that you're, you're being imperfect, but you are going, that, you, that you're not stuck in the starting blocks and thinking about it, you are actually taking some action. So uh, start with looking back. If you um, if you want to figure out where you're at with your spendable money that you have available to you, you can look at your at your tax returns. So you you would know, I, I imagine, what your your gross income is, either your 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 uh, per hour income or your annual income, your annual salary. But you may not be entirely clear about exactly how much you have to spend in the course of the year. So one of the things that you can do just to get a ballpark idea of what that is, is to look at your tax return and see what your uh, your total taxes paid were. So the number that you know off the top of your head, as in your, your total income, take that, deduct the uh, amount that's showing on your tax return, and that will give you a, a pretty reasonable picture of what your cash flow is for the year. And then you divide that by, by 12 if you want to have monthly budget or you divide it by 52. If you want to budget on a, on a weekly basis, it depends on you which way would be more manageable for you. And of course, you could just budget on a yearly basis, but it's pretty hard to know if you're staying within the lines if you only check every 365 days. So usually a weekly or a monthly budget is is going to give you the opportunity to do what you do to live your life but then have a checkpoint to, to say okay well have I been doing the things that I, uh, I would like to be doing or in terms of where I'm spending my money and uh, and if I'm not then what adjustments do I need to make with that so the other place that you can look in terms of uh, of what you're doing with that money having already determined with your uh, your tax return that you have a certain amount of money available is to then look at your account statements from your checking account, from your, your, your credit cards, see where it is that you're, you're spending your money, how much you're spending obviously uh, in, in your money. And you may already know where you're at with that because perhaps your, uh, your credit debts, your, uh, uh, your uh, individual borrowings or your credit card statements, the, uh, the balances you may have on there, or individual uh, loans that you might have, including perhaps uh, car loans, 
maybe maybe those things are growing or that you've added to those over the course of the last year or two. And so that's supplementing the money which you have as your own income, which is fine. And I'll come talk about uh, credit directly in, in a little bit. It's fine if you're doing that as long as you have an eye on that and that you have a purpose for it, that you know why it is you have borrowed the, that money and that you have a plan, even if it's a general plan, but it's got direction to it of how you are then going to eventually retire that um, that money that you have. So with that, we know where you're where you're at with the money that's available and where it is going to, at least in a rough way, the categories that it might be going to. And uh, and then look out over the next um, uh, few months. Where do you want to be from now until there? So once you come to the determination of where you're spending your money currently, where do you want to be spending your money? So project that out over the next few months to say that uh, that you want to adjust and have a little bit more going towards these categories of, of spending, a little bit less towards those. And you, you might see, <laughs> hear that and you say, well, that's kind of strange to talk about budgeting and talking about putting more money towards something. Well, as I said uh, at the start there, one of the things you want to do is pay yourself first, which means saving. And uh, and so if you want to save more towards your future, then finding ways that you can save uh, money towards uh, that purpose means that you need to release it from somewhere else and perhaps then spending a little bit less on one or more other types of uh, places where you use your money. So for you uh, as an individual, if it's if it's just you who's uh, who's doing this, then you can sit down and do that exercise on your own. But if there's more than just you in the house, then you need to have some idea of how it is that you each uh, deal with money and your attitudes towards money. So is everyone on side, as in the two of you uh, as a couple, if we we're talking about um, a uh, family situation in the same household, are the two of you on side? Uh, depending on how your household is set up, it may be that you, you need to also get the children, maybe the adult children or closing in on adult children, also to have an awareness of, uh, of the, the budgeting needs and, and make sure that everyone is on side. And it may very well be that you have different views of, uh, of how to manage money and you're not going to be able to reconcile those things. Even that is, uh, is a good thing to understand about yourself, about yourself personally, and about yourselves as a, uh, as a couple and as a family, so that you can deal with that. And it may be that, uh, that you don't necessarily agree to disagree, but you take different approaches on how you manage money and appreciate that we have different personalities in all sorts of ways, including our attitudes towards money and the way that we would like to make changes when we do want to make changes and how we go about doing that. So when we're, we're doing this, what we uh, want to do is get, create some routines that uh, will allow us to, to have checkpoints, uh, reviewing where we are at. Again, if you've uh, decided that you're going to do it on a, on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis of uh, your budgeting, then it, uh, don't make it so onerous that it becomes a painful exercise, but decide specifically where and when you're going to come back and review things. And perhaps that might be Saturday morning at eight o'clock and we're going to sit down at the kitchen table or at the dining room table or over in the office. Have a specific place you can come back to and uh, have the records that uh, that you have uh, obtained uh, that you use to start from and also the receipts that you have collected over the course of time so that you can see where you are, where things are going and make sure that uh, that you are on track and if you're not on track that you make appropriate adjustments to uh, to do that next question for you is is it in writing because this, the assumption quite often is that a budget must be in writing and if you don't have it in writing then it's not really a budget and i'll, I'll tell you honestly for me I don't have a, I don't have a written financial plan. I shouldn't say that as somebody who works in the industry here, but I, I don't have a written financial plan. I don't have a written budget per se. What I have is a spreadsheet that goes back uh, probably about 25 years ago is the original version of the spreadsheet. And the reason why I know that is because I migrated it from my laptop that I had at the time over into one of those original iMacs, the, the bubble iMacs that uh, came in in all sorts of colors, tangerine, uh, teal, blue, whatever. And I had one of those things in the, in the teal color. They came out in 1998. And so I know that I had the spreadsheet already going and it became uh, um, much more of a monster spreadsheet over the years. But that's the way that I do budgeting. I, I like 
spreadsheets. And so I'm comfortable with that. I don't monitor my, my activities on a day-to-day -day basis or on a week-to-week -week basis. What I do is I look at this from time to time and I used to look at it more often so that I've got things broken down the way that I had been managing money, how I wanted to adjust. And then I, I uh, put the new numbers in there as things came on. And I just kept an eye on that. And as long as I'm staying within those boundaries. So for me, it's not about saying there's one way to go. It's here's the boundaries I have for this category. As long as I'm staying in there, I don't really get concerned about uh, about going a little bit high or a little bit low for any one individual time period. As long as overall I'm uh, I'm managing things in a, in a reasonable way. So now, uh, for a lot of people, it's not just a matter of having paper uh, spreadsheets. We have. Um, uh, all sorts of software and apps and and dedicated uh, websites that will assist with people's budgeting. And for you, it may be that you you want to uh, make use of all that crazy technology that's available out there, or you like the idea of uh, of going back to something that's a little bit more manual. That becomes a little bit more challenging these days as we don't have as much paper money and coin money that we transact with. We do have to work with the uh, the way that we exchange money these days, a lot of tapping and uh, and transfers that are happening digitally, but uh, find the, uh, the way that works best for you within what's available so that you can manage your money in your way and keep on with the plan that you have. So uh, in terms of the categories, for you, it could be any number of categories that, uh, that you want to use. It could be these that, are, that I'm showing here. I've got nine categories uh, showing here. That would roughly round out the way that people would spend their money. The reason, by the way, I have the uh, the first one up there, emergency reserves and savings, is again, to make sure that you are paying yourself first. It may be that you need to make ends meet. You don't have much in order to set aside to savings, but at least I want it to be the first priority consideration to make sure that you are taking care of yourself first and that you, you do look at the possibility of having reserve money in case there is some kind of, of an urgent need, not necessarily an emergency as in a tragic situation, but perhaps a, uh, an earlier breakdown of the dishwasher than you really thought there was going to be if you had a sinking account a reserve that was for appliances then it might not have all of the money there and available for you but it would release some of the stress to deal with that known eventuality that came at a, an earlier time than you thought it was going to happen so I, I like to put that first as as in saving for yourself on into the future and saving on into the future for those things that you don't necessarily have control over and then the usual kinds of categories, shelter and household, uh, transportation, communication and groceries, and the other ones that are, uh, are showing thereafter. On average, across, across the entire population, and the written piece that um, we're gonna share with you has more details on this. On average, across the entire population, those next four categories, I'll read them off again, I'm gonna look over at them. Shelter and household, transportation, communication and groceries. That's about half of the spending of an average person's budget. And if you add in taxes along with that, you're up to about two thirds of what it is that you spend with your, uh, your money that you have available to you. So the big ones, obviously, having some, uh, some clear picture on what those are, how much you are spending in those areas, and keeping on top of those ones is going to be significantly uh, uh, affecting how it is you live your life in terms of those big areas. But at the same time, as you know, I'll you know, come back to that coffee concept, little things, if you're not careful about them, can add up. We just don't want to cut out all of the little things that actually give us the enjoyment in life. We want to make sure that we can afford to do whatever amount of them allow us to enjoy our life now and allow us to uh, enjoy our life on into the future. But, uh, Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to the uh, next slide, but I just wanted to stop here and see if there are any questions. We're about halfway through the, uh, the slides at this point, and so I just wanted to check with you to see if anything's come up. No, oh, yeah, thanks, Doug. There's been a couple comments, questions about getting started, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase them together a little bit. Um, there was one comment about feeling that these are all, you know, budgeting is really important, but I'm I'm really going to apply these later when I'm making more money in the future. We both know that there's advantage to getting started now, regardless of how small potentially, but 
any psychological trips or ma tricks or maybe behavioral patterns that you can suggest to just get started, to just get over that hump of something that might feel a little intimidating at first, but we know that there's real benefit to getting started. Yeah, I I uh, I, I smile as you're saying that because uh, I <laughs> the, the just getting started, like having the routine, even if it's an empty vessel, having the vessel in place that is going to carry you out out into the future is uh, is an important step to uh, to get into. And and today, the reason I was smiling is because in my case, I've got um, uh, I don't know how many categories, uh, maybe about these these nine roughly major categories, and then within those uh, a number of subcategories. In terms of accounts, and I'll come to this in a second, I, I've got about forty three different accounts for different purposes. Some duplication, so there's there's education accounts for each of my three kids, for example. So that that takes up some of those, and of course there's retirement savings accounts that uh, that we have. But there are forty three of those things, and and every so often I go back and check and see what the number is. But it, for years, it's been between 40 and 50 accounts, depending on what we're doing. One of the things is we each get an allowance. Uh, my wife, my kids and myself, we each get an allowance. And uh, when things get tight, I, instead of saying I'm not going to take an allowance, I, I still give myself an allowance. Uh, my allowance, though, is is, uh, is in cents. And it's the number of, uh, of years that I'm old. <laughs> so right now, my allowance on a weekly basis is 57 cents, but I don't turn it off. I, I, I've set it up so that so the structure is there and I'm aware of, of that being something which is necessary because I'd be pretty boring, maybe I am, I'd be pretty boring if I never spent anything on myself that's enjoyable and only do the things that are obligatory. So as you're starting up, coming back to the point that you're raising there, as you're starting up, putting the hard effort in early on to come up with a, a structure, a breakdown of categories that you're comfortable with and, and getting that in place and not necessarily funding into it, but but having it in place so that you, you have it in mind that those are the things that you want to do and the targets that you have for each of those as how much you would want to save into each of these areas or maintain yourself under in each of these areas. And then maybe just go ahead and continue to live your life, but keep that awareness of what that is and do come back to it and look at that from time to time. And then once you do get to the point where you, you've gotten the resolve to go ahead and start adjusting the actual numbers and the behaviors that you have, then it won't be completely new. You'll already be familiar with the structure and now you're going to fund it. You're going to populate it with the money in the way that you want to carry it out. That's a, I mean, that's, I don't know if that's that helpful to someone as, as, a, um, as a starting point because it does call upon you to, to really make some conscious effort early on, but that's kind of the nature of it. You do have to put the effort in. Once you are doing it though, you will get to the point where you are, are comfortable working with this and come back. The other word that I was using early on is that you're confident that this is going to help you. This is going to get you to where you're going. And then you keep on adding on little bits as you're as you're going along. And eventually it becomes a routine that you don't even necessarily have to consciously, consciously be thinking about. It takes care of itself without need of, of you uh, being a police police officer over top of yourself. Um, there, there, there was a there was a clarifying question here, Doug. Uh, it's making me smile. <laughs> you mentioned having forty three accounts. Are these actual accounts at your at your financial institution, ideally a credit union, Doug? Or, they, or are these are these your categories on your spreadsheet, or is it effectively both? These are they are effectively both, and they are actually those accounts. And yes, they are. Uh, they're, well, they're a combination because I've worked in a variety of places, and so I've got historical connections with a number of financial institutions. And I didn't want to necessarily move all of those monies uh, in into one place, but I do have the 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 bulk of my money activity is credit union, is the truth, and uh, and I do have a couple of other institutions that um, that, that I use. So when my pay comes in. Uh, I get paid bi-weekly. When my pay comes in, on, on the day that it comes in, money comes out of the account that it comes into and goes off into these various places. And that doesn't mean there's 43 of them every single week, but they are set up to automatically happen. So I, I really don't see the money coming in and coming out and have to make decisions about those things 
that happens automatically in the background so that I know how much I've got to work with. And I look at my accounts and I see that I've got, uh, uh, well, I've got a large amount in the in the family activities account because that's actually the kids dance and music and, and sports. Uh, there's a large amount in there, but I'm conscious of it. We're conscious of that. So when we spend our money and one of the kids says that they want to do something really big, then you say, yeah, I don't know about that because we've already got this much set aside towards that purpose. And as much as they might whine about it, they're actually familiar enough that uh, uh, with the fact that we do this kind of budgeting and they do, and one of them just walked by. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was mentally in my head. I was doing my own mental accounting around the number of accounts between, you know, my wife and I. I mean, we each have an RSP, a TFSA, checking account. Uh, I mean, there's that, that's six already and I'm, I haven't thought very hard. So you start adding in, you know, individual RSP accounts, RESPs for the kids, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it, it can add up pretty quickly. So um, I got a question and, and here I about- have, I do have an account that is called appliances. I have one that is called cars. I have one that is uh, is specifically about household expense. I got, I got all these things in, yeah. in these categories that got allocated off into. Fantastic. With our online banking, you could actually personalize those account names for whatever you want. That's right. But uh, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of questions here or thoughts here around, you know, paying yourself first. But I'm, I'm going to let you go forward because I think some of them are going to tie in a little bit later uh, to some of the cash flow and different and different topics that you're going to touch on. But there are, there are a couple of questions I'll I'll save as we move forward. Okay, so uh, and and I I've probably I've I've already referred to some of the things uh, early on that I'm going to talk about as as I'm rolling through here, but I got I got another four slides that I'm I'm going to take you through, and and the things that I've I've got in here, are uh, are, are points that I may have already made, but in context now I'm I'm going to uh, just flesh those out a little bit. So now that you've you've gotten to the point where you you've got a a good sense of what your inflows are, what you are spending your money on, and now where you've categorized and said, well, where would I like to be spending my money? How do you get from from here to there? So looking at where you're spending your money, you need to get into what I refer to as a little bit of uh, financial triage, or as is showing here on the uh, on the image, satisficing. And satisficing is a combination of satisfying yourself, but making appropriate sacrifices so that overall you are, are satisfied with the, the way things are operating. So with your finances, are you uh, somebody who, good for you, are able to surf on top of the, the world? You're just, you're just happy as, uh, as you can be, just being on the waves and just heading out there and, uh, and enjoying the, the view. Or are you treading water? Are you managing along, but you're not really getting anywhere? Or in the worst case, are you actually going under? And of course, that's a really drastic situation to be in. We don't want to be there, but sometimes that can be the case. And so we just want to keep from putting ourselves in uh, in that position. So when we, we look at the money that we have, we want to look at, at when we have the money and, and the cash flow of that money, the timing of, uh, of the money. So the triage that we're looking at is the type of expenses that we have, the outlays that we have, is a given expense something which is absolutely necessary, so inescapable? Is it something which is discretionary, which you uh, you would like to uh, to spend the money on, but you can't necessarily do that in practicality all the time? Or is it much further out there? It is, it, is it truly a luxury? Is it something which not only could you do without it on a current basis, you may very well be able to do without it altogether? Again, understanding that, that these are the things that give flavor to life. And so you don't want to be saying, well, I'm only going to do necessities and I'm going to live like a pauper and, uh, and be worried about every tragic thing that can happen. You want to make sure that you are, are living your life the way that you're entitled to live your life. But keep this in mind, the, uh, the, the continuum from necessity to discretionary to luxury items that you have. In terms of, uh, of what the expenses are, if you are trying to reduce down costs, look at the things which are fixed expenses and those things which are variable expenses. And I don't want to, uh, to make this into an accounting lesson. I'm not an accountant, by the way. I am a lawyer, not an accountant, but I don't want to turn this into an accounting lesson and say, say, all right, well, you have to categorize all of these things. And, and there are those things that are plant and equipment. And then there are those things that are cost of goods sold. What we want to look at is 
things that we really cannot escape, whether they are necessities or discretionaries or luxuries, but that we cannot escape because of the commitments that we've made, because they may, in, in fact, be things that are, that are fixed uh, obligations that, that run out for a period of time. And then there are other things which are variable in nature, both in terms of the amounts and our ability to step away from those things. And when we look at those, then we can use this little acronym, seeing red, what we can do with them to try to, to alleviate stress is to see which of those things, having characterized whether they are fixed or the variable, variable type of expenses, things that we can reduce, so just knock it down a little bit, things that we can totally eliminate because uh, they, they don't have to be something that we are spending money on, at least not on a current basis, or things that we can defer, when the defer part of it is really the timing uh, of things that uh, it might be something that we, we really do have to uh, to change the oil in the car. Probably not the best example because you don't want to put your, your car in, the, in a difficult position, but we do have to change the oil on the car, but we don't necessarily have to do it this month. Maybe it can be pushed out a little bit. So something where you know that it's going to come, but you, you are kicking it down the road, but you're conscious of, uh, of doing that, that it is something that's going to stretch out the time a little bit and give you a little bit of breathing room to uh, to get on top of uh, of other things as i said I'm gonna, i was going to talk about uh, uh credit and uh, and to me the um the the way to look at credit is like a time traveling card or uh, a time traveling tool what you are doing with credit in, in my view of the world is you have a particular need at the current point in time but you don't have all the resources available to you, the financial resources to, to be able to, uh, to pay for that uh, out of your current resources. And so what you're doing is, it's not so much that you're borrowing from a financial institution in order to help you out, which is the truth of the, the mechanics of what happens. You are borrowing from your own future capacity to earn income to pay for yourself right now. So that's, that's what essentially you're doing. You're time traveling to take from future you to take care of current you. And there are reasons why you might do that for very good reasons. And other times, maybe it's a little bit frivolous. The, the really good reasons quite often are things like, I'm going to buy a house and I don't have, you know, whatever number of zeros you have to put past the, uh, the dollar sign these days, but I don't have that readily available right now. I've got a reasonable down payment and I'm going to take out a mortgage, which I'm going to pay off over the course of time, which means that I am asking my future self to earn income and pay that down over the course of time. So I, I look at that as, as time traveling with credit. Important thing to understand about using credit is that it's not going to be used, we're talking about personal expenses, it's not used as, as a business expense. It, with a business expense, if you're running a business, then your cost of credit can be a tax deduction. So that makes it less costly. It doesn't change the fact that you've borrowed and you have to pay back the interest and the principal involved, but it makes it a little bit less costly to service. In terms of personal expenses, what happens is you have to earn the income through whatever means you have, you then are taxed on the income that you earn from your payroll, from your employment, for example, and then you can pay the interest on the debt that you've incurred. As well, in paying back those principal amounts, you also have to pay that out of your after-tax money. So you, you earn on a pre-tax basis, but then the thing that gets in between being able to pay down those expenses is that you pay down in post-tax amounts. That's, uh, that's a, 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 a challenge for, uh, for people to be able to retire debt as, as quickly as they might want to be able to retire debt because of the tax being in between their earnings and then the use of that money. That's actually true of any kind of personal expenses that you earn in a pre-tax world and you spend in, a, in an after-tax world, but it becomes particularly difficult to manage if you uh, accumulate a significant amount of debt. So one of the things that you can do to keep on top of this, again, another uh, little acronym here. Oh, I don't have the acronym showing, but I'll, I'll tell you what the acronym is there. It's in the, the indented port portion there. The acronym is, is CLASP, uh, C-L-A-S-P. And what, you, what you'll do, so uh, Paul was saying, well, what are some of the things you can do to try to, to, uh, to get going with your, your budgeting? Well, one of the, the habits you can get into, if you're not already in this habit, 
is to collect a receipt every single time that you have a transaction, whether you use tap, or, or your credit or your debit or online, make sure that you get a receipt from, uh, from that activity. And then log those receipts. And that might seem like it's going to be a very onerous exercise to get into, but it, it, it's, it's a manageable thing to do if you have a set time when you're doing it on a, uh, on a, an, a, a annual, <laughs> on a weekly basis, so that you don't make it too much to do. And, and, and if logging them, as in writing things down on, on top of, of collecting up those might be a little bit much, then at the very least, you want to collect those receipts and collate them so that you have them available. You can see them, honestly, to see them physically, which is a reminder of where you're spending your money and how you're spending your money. Then if you've got those categories in place or when you've got those categories in place or when you are ready to populate the budgeting activities, then allocate the particular expenses on those receipts into the various categories and, uh, and look it over. That's where the scrutinize is. Look it over, see if this is actually what it is that you want to be spending your money on. And if it's not, with the, some of those other tips or, or, uh, or rules that I offered earlier, find a way to plan out into the future how it is that you adjust your behavior so that you are getting closer to your target activity, your target behavior that keeps you within the boundaries of, uh, of the money that you have. Now, I said uh, pay yourself first early on. I said I was going to have another comment similar to it later on. And my later on is here with this point about charge yourself first. Now, that may seem like it, it, I'm saying, hey, uh, go wild with your credit card. What I'm saying is when you are using your credit card, what you should be doing coming back to your, uh, your receipts is getting the receipt when you use the credit card going back home, whether you do it the same day or you do it at the end of the week, and taking the money that you have in your main account, uh, what I call my float account, from your main account and immediately allocating it either over directly against the credit card right away or into a holding reserve, which will accumulate over the course of the month. And then when your credit card bill comes in, you pay that thing off. So you are you are charging yourself first. So you are taking money out of your available cash in the main place where you have it so that you don't accidentally overspend. And by doing that on a regular basis, you're going to be conscious of just how much you have spent and you'll get into that routine of knowing, well, here's where I am in the month and I have to be careful that I don't overdo it as I'm leading up to the point where I'm going to have to pay off that bill. And as much as you can, if you can, for a lot of people, it can be helpful to carry cash rather than carrying a credit card or even a debit card, because once you spent the cash, there's nothing left in your pocket. So that can be a way to put yourself on a budget in, in, a, in an effective way by limiting the availability of what you have to spend. Difficult again in this world where we have uh, uh, much more of a, of a tapping kind of uh, world that we operate in and a lot of places particularly with the pandemic, don't like to be dealing with cash. You may not like to be dealing with cash, but where you can, then it will keep you from overspending because you just won't have that extra money to spend in those uh, those other places. So what we want to do is we want to have, uh, um, uh, again, those habits that we have in a routine, habits being the activities, routines being habits that have a time element associated with them. I already made the comment about the multiple accounts, again, in my case, 43 multiple accounts that, uh, that I have. One account, one very specific account that I was just referring to is the credit card reserve, which will, will look like you have a lot of money that, uh, that's available for you, except that you're not going to touch that as you keep shuttling money over in there as you're spending on a day-to-day, -day, on a weekly basis. That money is there to, to uh, pay off your credit card and you won't uh, uh, be in a position then if you are doing that on a regular basis, you won't be in a position where you're going to be forced to carry a balance. And if you are already carrying a balance, then maybe you can kick in a little bit more money every single week into that on a, on a regular routine basis and, and slowly knock down the, uh, the credit card uh, debt that you have. Faster is better than uh, than slow, but, uh, but if there's just no way that you can do that without having 
a, a serious concern about your your health uh, if you uh, were to go at it really hard then uh, then come up with a way that you can set aside a little bit and uh, chip away at it to uh, to move it down uh, also having recurring bills in a shuttle account uh, with recurring bills, for example, that happen on a monthly basis, you might get paid weekly or bi-weekly, but those bills come in on a monthly basis. If you want to uh, make sure that you are not, again, overspending money that appears to be ready to buy that new TV or or that uh, that pair of awesome shoes, if you are taking that money, determine how much those recurring bills are going to be. And sometimes you might have to approximate what they're going to be, depending on whether it's your internet bill or your uh, your utility bill that uh, might be variable with some of those things every single week. And, and this is what happens with uh, with my account on payday. Every single week, money goes out into the utility reserve account. And when those bills come in, then it is paid out that utility reserve. And there's enough in there in my case that it never goes down below zero. It just fluctuates all the time, but cash is going in there every week. I don't get surprised by the bills as they come in. Similarly, if you have bills that might be not uh, uh, happening every single month, something like let's say property tax, it happens usually depending on your jurisdiction, uh, every two or three months that uh, you might get a property tax installment that's necessary. And every single week, set aside money towards that purpose, and it'll look like that money is available to you because you got that that reserve that's getting larger. But then, when you get the whopping bill from the property tax from the municipality, you've got that money sitting there that uh, can be allocated towards that purpose. So, the levelizing within the year—that's what I'm talking about. There is taking expenses that might happen at different times uh, within the year and uh, and making sure that you are setting aside money on a regular basis, not just waiting until it happens and then saying, well, where's my big pot of money? Setting aside on a regular basis, levelizing the lumpy account amounts that might, you might have due and, and setting aside the money towards those purposes during the course of the year and through automated weekly and monthly uh, allocations, you don't even have to look at those yourselves. Likewise, then not only do you have those things that are happening in that way, but you can also levelize over the course of longer periods of time. We already talked about the uh, the appliances, for example. Appliances, you don't know when it's going to happen, but they're not going to last forever. If you're setting aside a bit of money over the course of, of years towards that, it doesn't have to be an enormous amount, but estimating when the, the life is going to be for the various appliances that you have, setting aside amount in your, your weekly budget, when you have that surprise loss of the uh, the dishwasher, then again, it's not going to be an emergency. It's an unfortunate uh, additional expense, but you've already set aside the money for it or, or some reasonable amount of the money towards it. And it allows you to not get into a panic with your finances and, and work through those things and, and actually feel good about yourself when those things happen. Pat yourself on the back and say, wow, this could have been an emergency. This could have been a traumatic event, but it's not because I, I coached myself. I got myself into that routine so that it's not a problem uh, situation for me. And then overall, what we're trying to do, uh, getting into those daily routines, that class, collecting the uh, the receipts and logging, allocating, et cetera, going through those things as a, as a daily uh, activity, working those through on a monthly uh, basis to uh, to come back and review things, adjust as is necessary, either adjust yourself on a monthly basis or on a little bit longer term as you're doing, as you go through a few months, maybe on a seasonal or quarterly basis. If, if things are, are just not uh, working out, that you're not staying within the budget you have, then maybe you look at the budget that you, you think you can ma maintain and, and revisit that and say, is that really realistic? What it is that I think I'm going to do with that? Maybe I need to also adjust the, the budget. Sometimes you just make a shot at it and it's not quite right. So you adjust that. You adjust yourself, you adjust the, uh, uh, the budget, and we take the daily routines and turn them into an annual activity and that gives us a whole lifetime of habits that then just get built into how we, we manage our money. So, Paul, I'm, I'm going to bring it back to you and see if we have any further questions that have come up while I've been going through the last little bit here. And I'm going to bring up the uh, uh, the agenda so that people have that to look at if they want to uh, uh, come back and say, oh, that's right. Something occurred to me back at that point. So uh, I'll bring it back to you. Well, well for, first, the comment from from me, Doug, I really like the way that you sort of characterized the difference between an emergency fund 
for stuff that you couldn't possibly predict going to happen in your life. And I like the idea of the expected fund. That, that to be honest, is I don't know why I've never come across that sort of idea before, but emergency fund, one issue, expected fund. Like, yeah, I'm going to have to replace my appliances someday. I'm going to have to replace the tires on my car someday. Like, you know this stuff's going to happen. You just don't know exactly when. So there were some questions about, you know, maybe how you set up the transfer system to your numerous accounts and, and 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 some financial institutions do have minimum, you know, minimum balances, or else there's yeah. fees and things involved on the account. So I'm just wondering, maybe and you're you're obviously very detailed on this, and you've been doing this for a while, so you've got your system down. <laughs> I'm just wondering. I didn't start you know, off that way, by the way. Yeah, it, yeah. it's like. So that's what I wanted when, to ask: is how did you start? Because you didn't start with 43 distinct accounts. No. Way back when, if I had looked out to now, I, I would think, wow, what a monster that thing is. I, I never would have created this thing from scratch the way that I, I operate things. But because I've got the momentum of how I, I had been doing it in a more simple, simplified way, it, it has become more complex. And uh, and so it, it's just developed over the course of time into the ways that, uh, that I operate with things. One of the things that I do, by the way, and I just actually did this um, uh, last weekend, uh, once I got my my uh, my refund on my taxes, um, I uh, I do put particular numbers that are recognizable in my uh, in my, in my transfers. So, for example, uh, I, I've got this series of uh, of money transfers that are happening now, which are only going to happen between now and the end of this year because they're related to my my tax refund. And so I've got $11.11 going towards one purpose. I've got $22.22 going towards another and 33.33 going to another. So they're, they're easily visual to me when I look at the, at the accounts, what those things are. So that uh, if, if for whatever reason, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what an odd expense might be if I'm looking down the list of uh, what's going on with the money, then I can just skip over those types of things. So I, I do tend to do those types of things uh, to to bring it to my attention <laughs> uh, to, to do those. And as I say, otherwise, uh, I've, uh, I've got the accounts that, uh, set up that, that very closely align with the budget categories and um, and they happen in the background where I don't have to look at them. No, it's been, no, it's great, great ideas, Doug. I mean, I was certainly just was you know, I think the question was, you know, I don't, I can understand someone not wanting to set up maybe 17 distinct sort of potential <laughs> accounts. So there probably is still value in having the one. The concept of pay yourself first is obviously a clearly established retirement approach, a certain percentage of your income set aside each, you know, each pay period, ideally going automatically into your retirement account. You don't think about it much. It's money you never have. I mean, it is, this is a similar concept, really, of paying yourself first, whatever that percentage might, might be. If it's, I'm just going to pick some numbers out of the air because they will differ on you and your plan. But if it's 10% pay yourself first in your retirement account, maybe it's two or three into your future needs account or whatever is appropriate so that when you do have those big bills, uh, you're all set. And maybe you don't have to worry about some of those account minimums and fees and other things. And, and over time, we will all strive to become as detailed as you with the <laughs> 33, 33 and the 22, 22 and the 11, 11 or whatever, whatever, uh, 44, 44, presumably that you have going on. Um, there's a question about do your do your accounts uh, include transfers to your RSPs and TFSAs or these all checking savings accounts? I mean, I, I we do have some owners frankly, that treat their TFSA as a, frankly, one type of emergency fund. It may, again, it should, maybe it's not an emergency fund, but it's an expected fund, right? I mean, it's maybe it's money they know that they're going to have to contribute to a child's wedding or they're putting it away for the cottage or the new car, and they don't know exactly when it's going to happen. So I guess there's just a question there about um, what types of accounts do you use? Our RSPs may not be as ideal in this scenario. Yeah, so I, I actually I don't transfer directly. So I, I got my workplace um, RSP with with employer, and then outside of that, I also do uh, RSP contributions. But I don't do a weekly contribution into RSPs. What I do is I've got a transfer that happens from uh, from my account over into what I refer to as a shuttle account, which is TFSA to RSP shuttle account. So it is a TFSA account. 
And so every week there's an amount that goes into that TFSA. It's not a huge amount. And, and I have not used up all of my TFSA room because I'm one of those people that hammered on the mortgage first and, uh, and then have room for RSP contributions now beyond what people might think I would have and likewise with TFSAs. But I actually set aside the weekly amounts to go into TFSA. And then when I get to December, I then make a decision about what I want to do with that money going over into RSP. But the investment structure of my TFSA for that purpose is exactly the same as what my RSP is on an ongoing basis. And so when I come to December, I pull the money out of the TFSA before we hit year end, and then I get the credit to go back into TFSA on January the 1st. So I pull it out of the TFSA and then contribute it over into RSP at year end. And what that does for me in part is if I do have a really, a really unexpected emergency of some sort, I could raid that money during the course of the year. Whereas if I'd already committed it into the RSP, if you pull it out of the RSP, you lose the RSP room altogether and it's taxable on coming out of the RSP. It would be really kind of messy. So that's one of those things that I, uh, I consciously do to give myself a little bit more flexibility with the retirement savings. Okay. Well, thank you, Doug. Certainly appreciate all the, uh, the thoughts, the advice, the insights that you've shared with us tonight. I certainly know that that budgeting and, and these concepts can be complicated. Um, we have tools to help. Frankly, we're working on a pretty cool tool for these things right now that's in test phase with a number of our owners. So more to come on that, which will allow for some of this aggregation and budgeting and spending. So you don't maybe have to be quite so manual with it. More to come on that soon. Bit of a spoiler alert for you. Um, our Libro.ca calculators, we have over 20 there of varying complexity to answer some of these questions. Or if you're stuck and you don't know where to start, pick up the phone, go online, reach out to one of our coaches. We have all kinds of dedicated individuals here to help, whether your question is more in the budgeting lending phase, whether it's more in the investing or the wealth planning stage of your life. We do have experts that can help. All of our financial planners and financial advisors are duly accredited to be called financial planners, and we're very proud of that at Libro. We hope you enjoyed tonight's webinar. Like we said, there will be a replay link available and some follow-up information. Thanks again to Doug Carroll from Aviso Wealth for joining us this evening. And uh, please feel free to ask questions and join us next time. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.